Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Meredith Shanda, and I am the Director of Clinic Operations for the MAVEN Project. Thank you all for joining us today. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Kumar Venkat today for his educational talk in the beginning of our rheumatology marathon. So we'll begin today with our session on rheumatoid arthritis and a brief introduction to Dr. Venkat. He is a board certified rheumatologist who is currently part of the teaching faculty at Kaiser and the UC Riverside School of Medicine. Previously, he's held faculty positions at UC Irvine, USC, and the Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, and ran the residency program at Kaiser as well. He has a significant number of speaking opportunities, including local and national conferences for Kaiser, CME lectures at Kaiser Orange County, as well as close to home in his local community clinics. And with that, Dr. Venkat, you are free to start your presentation. Thank you, Meredith. Uh... Uh, we're going to start off today with the first topic. This is rheumatoid arthritis and its mode and management, followed by another important topic, gout, in the next hour. Thank, uh, thank you all for uh, coming and this uh, morning, and hopefully uh, uh, you and I will both have a good learning experience from uh, this session. In essence, my talk is going to be the changing concepts of disease and changing paradigms and management. These are some of the uh, requirements of UCLA. So the objectives uh, are outlined here. We'll try to cover a very vast subject in the next 15 minutes and uh, basically understand a little bit about the disease and its uh, pathophysiology and immunopathology, which is very essential for you to understand the advances in modern management and discuss some of the current recommendations of ACL guidelines, American College of Rheumatology guidelines in the management. Now, rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic systemic inflammatory disease whose hallmark feature is a persistent symmetrical polyarthritis associated with synovitis, which is inflammation of the synovium, affecting principally the uh, proximal joints in the hands and feet, uh, meaning the PIP joints and the uh, MCP and MTP joints respectively. Any joint which is lined by a synovial membrane in essence can be involved. And this is just not a disease confined to the joints as all of you know, it is a systemic disease which has uh, numerous extra articular uh, manifestations involving organs such as the skin, the heart, lungs, uh, eyes, and even the uh, central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Now, who gets rheumatoid arthritis? It's theorized that one can develop rheumatoid arthritis when you're genetically susceptible and there is, you experience any kind of an external trigger. Uh, what is very interesting is even cigarette smoking can be a trigger uh, through a very complex mechanism uh, involving the citrullination of proteins and that led to the discovery of the uh, anti-CCP antibody. Then infections, viral many times, uh, even speculation about streptococcus in the past and trauma to the joint may be a trigger in setting up an autoimmune reaction. Now, women are affected uh, approximately three times more often than men. No test is really pathognomonic. So there is uh, a, a very important uh, correlation between the clinical and the laboratory uh, uh, tests uh, that are made available when you're investigating the patient. The diagnosis is made by a combination of clinical laboratory and imaging features. Now, the disease is prone to exacerbations and remissions. And the hope is that in most of the patients with the current uh, treatment modalities available, that you try to keep the disease in remission most of the time. And that may prevent uh, uh, serious or sinister systemic complications. Now, advanced bio disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. I very often use this acronym DMARD. So that is disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Uh, these have emerged in the last two decades uh, and many of them are referred to in common parlance as biologicals. Now the outcome in RA is compromised when diagnosis and treatment are delayed. So the important um, message or mantra is detect the disease early and start your treatment early. Now, 
So this slide shows how altering the course of RA uh, is going to improve the lives of uh, those afflicted with it. Now, when you, the disease, uh, the patient presents with early disease to the rheumatologist, the damage to the joints have already started uh, right from day one that the inflammation sets in. And you can see here the arrows pointing in different direction. The ideal course is the baseline, treated early, treated late, and if you leave it for its natural course. Uh, not only is the patient going to be deformed uh, and disabled, but could also have a premature death, which I'll allude to in another slide. And uh, so lowering the disease activity early means better quality of life. And uh, early treatment is key and early aggressive treatment is a key, uh, which has better results. And that's why so many new drugs have come into play in bringing about early remission and maintaining that remission. And then uh, more the better, greater in number of traditional uh, DMARDs have become available in the last two decades, uh, in improving our therapeutic armamentarium. And the biological agents uh, that have exceeded our expectations in comparison to the more older and traditional DMARDs, which were available for the last uh, uh, four decades or so. And we also have better disease activity measurement tools by which we can assess the uh, results from our early and aggressive therapy. Now, this is a very important slide showing that even though it affects young people, uh, the mortality rate was very high prior to the availability of some of these new drugs. So you can see what the tremendous uh, increase in mortality occurred in the earlier years uh, from this disease. They were to run a natural course. Now, this brings us to a very important uh, uh, aspect of this disease, which I wanted to allude to earlier on. So you, uh, just to impress upon you why untreated RA can result in premature death. Now, cardiovascular disease is markedly increased in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, partly due to accelerated atherosclerosis from just chronic inflammation. And traditional cardiovascular risk factors, all of you are familiar with, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking, diabetes, physical inactivity are highly prevalent among patients with RA who are disabled, and that further aggravates the risk. Now, plaque formation in the arteries is an endothelial, part of an endothelial dysfunction, and many of the pro-inflammatory cytokines and adhesion molecules, which are released during active inflammation in RA, worsens the uh, formation of the atheros sclerotic plaque in the vessels. And also, this may be an independent factor uh, outside of uh, the influence of diabetes or hypertension. So is an independent risk factor for the cardiovascular death. Now, many of the immuno immunologically derived substances uh, and anti autoantibodies, such as anti-CCP and rheumatoid factor, also alter endothelial function. And when you're looking at the markers of inflammation to assess the activity of the arthritis, SED rate and CRP, there's now growing evidence that CRP in particular may be able to give you some uh, idea about the intimal media thickness, which is the surrogate of atherosclerotic disease. And there's growing evidence that there's also the development of a pro-atherogenic high-density lipoprotein, the setting of inflammation in MARA. So every which way you look, inflammation is the cornerstone of, uh, uh, in, in terms of the causation of CVD risk. And what has happened with the more and aggressive treatments is that we may have lessened that risk if we started the treatment early. So that is the most important message. So your fatal and non-fatal CVD is increasing patients with RA compared to the general population. And you have to recognize and treat this risk early in terms of CHF and coronary artery disease. Now, one important uh, message here is that the long-term use of glucocorticoids uh, during the course of rheumatoid arthritis definitely increases the risk of atherogenesis and uh, heightens the risk of CAD.
And one of the important things which has emerged in modern treatment, in the modern treatment of rheumatoid is that we are using less and less of corticosteroids. We are able to use steroid sparing agents uh, uh, and that may actually help uh, protect the individual from accelerated arthrogenesis. Now, another important uh, topic which I want to uh, set the stage on is risk of malignancy. The risk of malignancy in patient RA has been studied very well. And the last three or four decades, we know that untreated aggressive rheumatoid arthritis poses a fourfold increased risk of getting a malignancy, particularly a lymphoma. That is because in RA, when it's driven by the T cell, the uh, T uh, helper cell drives the B cell to produce uh, uh, a number of autoantibodies. The B cell actually goes berserk when it's stimulated by the T cell. And that has a lot to do with the possibility of oncogenesis. And what has happened is with the advent of all these new drugs, we are able to control the disease early and lessen the risk of the malignancy, uh, which uh, these patients may be predisposed to. At the same time, as with all other new modalities of therapy, there was a, a lot of concern when biologics were introduced that they would result uh, in a lymphoma because they may have some other effects on oncogenesis. But uh, in the last two decades, since we've used biologics, actually that risk is not significant. These have been borne out by studies uh, from registries in advanced countries uh, in terms of healthcare, like the Scandinavian uh, countries, where the results show that by treating RA early and aggressively actually lessens the risk of uh, malignancy like lymphoma. skip all these slides here. Now, we are aware of a very important antibody called ACPA, antibody circulated proteins. These are peptides post-translationally modified by conversion of origin into citrulline. And these become very specific markers for rheumatoid arthritis, even more than the rheumatoid factor. So much so that today we order the RF and the uh, ACPA together. And there are many instances where the RF will be negative, ACPA is positive. So the ACPA is positive, uh, it is a lot more important because that uh, tells you in advance that this individual who has these antibodies is likely to have more aggressive disease. Th that means more aggressive uh, uh, the disease in the sense that they are at greater risk for systemic complications and early death. So the other important thing to remember that uh, cigarette smoking increases the risk of getting antibodies to citrullinated proteins. Now, this is a very important connection. Now, there have been patients with RA who have been smokers who have had a positive ACPA years preceding the clinical onset of the disease. So you have to be watchful in smokers. The best thing as a clinician you can do is to uh, you know, uh, talk to the patients who have rheumatoid to stop smoking period, because that is going to help them uh, get a better outcome. Now, so the risk, this is a very important cartoon showing you all the risk factors, which I alluded to. Uh, the risk factors, you can see genetic susceptibility, smoking, microbiota, female sex, Western diet, ethnic factors, post-translational modification, that's a citrullination, then autoantibody formation, and then the expansion of the autoantibody profile. Early stage, there's no detectable autoimmunity. Then there's initiation of autoimmunity. That's when you want to strike. Strike the iron while it's hot. At that point, you treat the patient aggressively. And they may be asymptomatic or very early symptomatic phase of the disease. And then the propagation of the autoimmunity uh, leads to more and more aggression, destruction uh, of the joints, disability, and then systemic complications and premature death. So that's the uh, uh, chain of events which happens in rheumatoid arthritis. Now, I want to make, uh, this is a very busy slide, but basically I want you to concentrate on the smoking and the citrullination effects. The other important thing which is borne out is there are certain bacteria in the gingiva, the periodontal infections may set up inflammation, which may be linked with 
the uh, enzyme release which may be involved in citrullination and that may uh, trigger uh, the autoimmune process so that is a very very important thing and then the second part of the, uh, the bottom part of the slide shows you how immune complexes in addition to the citrullinated proteins and other triggers uh, activate macrophages and it interacts with the antigen presenting cell then you have cytokines released most important one is tnf alpha uh, culminating in joint destruction uh, due to inflammation now this is a very important slide uh, because if you understand this part of of the pathophysiology of the disease, all the treatments are going to be based on that in the future and what exists at the present time. So the endothelial cells results in extensive angiogenesis and uh, that explains the vascularity of the synovium and the risk of bleeding inside the joint. Sometimes when you tap a rheumatoid patient, you get uh, a hemorrhagic effusion. And then the links with the anti antigen presenting cell with the IL-1223, IL-1 TNF, and then the uh, importance of the neutrophil, uh, along with prostaglandin proteases and other reactive oxygen intermediates. Then that interacting with the B cell, T cell, and the macrophages, causing more cytokine release. And then the synovial tissue gets inflamed. Then the subchondral bone is exposed. Now, one other important thing that I want you to uh, understand from this particular slide is the osteoblasts in the bone are initially stimulated by the inflammation, but as the chondrocytes decrease and the osteoblast function uh, uh, decreases, the osteoclasts take over through the rank ligand mechanism. And that's why you see these erosions and extensive osteoporosis uh, even earlier on in rheumatoid bones. Now, that's a very another important signaling pathway called JAK inhibition, which works through several other mechanisms. And this is a very important cytokine, which I'll allude to later in the talk. Now, the hallmark, as I told you, is persistent synovitis, and the disease will fluctuate over time. Now, the commonly affected joints, this is a diagram that shows you 40 to 50% of the time, the upper cervical spine may be affected, the first two vertebrae. And that is an important part of the anatomy because it's lined by a synovial membrane. The temporomandibular joints, 20 to 30%, again, lined by synovial membrane. Elbow, 40 to 50%, shoulder, 50 to 60%. Most of the action is in the wrist and the hands. The wrist, about 80 to 90, and the hands, MCP and PIPs, uh, in the rain, MCPs particularly, 90 to 95%, PIPs up to 90%. In the hip, about 50%, knee about 60%, ankle about 50 to 80%, and again, predominantly in the feet. That distribution in a symmetrical fashion, the polyarticular symmetrical distribution is the hallmark of clinical rheumatoid arthritis. And this is a panoply of uh, uh, organs that can be involved, starting with the eye, of which the most important is episcleritis and scleritis. Scleritis is uh, uh, not treated aggressively early, it can expose the choroid, that's called scleromalacia perforans. Then lung, ILD, pleural effusions, and other complications of DMARDs, uh, like methotrexate, and uh, even uh, leflunamide. Skin, the onset of nodules, which herald the onset of vascular lesions. If you see nodules, the disease is going to be aggressive, and these patients are generally rheumatoid factor or uh, citrulline antibody positive. Then you can have hepatotoxicity from DMARDs or peptic ulcer disease from use of uh, NSAIDs. Entropic neuropathy, most common is carpal tunnel syndrome, cervical myelopathy due to upper cervical involvement. They can have a mixed peripheral neuropathy or a mononeuritis multiplex due to uh, small vessel vasculitis. Uh, and then, of course, vascular accelerated atherosclerosis and Raynaud's phenomenon. Uh, which is due to spasm of the postcapillary venule. Then coronary artery disease, pericarditis with or without effusion can occur. Renal manifestations long term. The main thing is tubular interstitial nephritis, which is main, mostly a complication of, B, of NSAIDs, but rarely untreated uh, rheumatoid can result in secondary amyloidosis and proteinuria nephrotic syndrome. Then the uh, joints are affected, but also. Paraarticular structures, tendon, bursae, are affected. 
long-term disease untreated can lead to muscular atrophy and then osteoporosis and risk of fractures in the bones affected. Then hematologically, you can get a anemia chronic disease or blood loss from uh, bleeding, GI bleeding caused by NSAIDs, uh, very rarely hemolytic anemia. Thrombocytosis usually in the early stage marks aggressive disease. Thrombocytopenia, anemia, and leukopenia can occur, neutropenia can occur as a complication of uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, uh, causing splenomegaly, which is very often referred to as Pelty syndrome. And also the meninges, lep the leptomeninges can be affected. The classic picture, def defining picture in rheumatoid arthritis, you can see the swelling here, and to some extent the swelling in the MCP joint there. And then as the disease progresses, you're seeing the wasting of the muscles and the drift, and then the Z deformity of the thumbs. The two important uh, defects that you get, the boutonniere, the buttonhole deformity and swan neck deformity. The buttonhole deformity is you get a flexion here because there is a uh, lateral band of the volar surface which is affected and causes loss of motion. And the swan neck deformity, you have a DIP flexion, hyperextension of the PIP, again, due to tendon involvement. These are things which you are not going to see very often in modern practice because we never allow the disease to get that far. So that's important, but it's a painful reminder of what patients in the past went through, the kinds of difficulty they experienced in untreated disease. Then this is, again, the subluxation deformities in all the MTP joints, the PIP joints of the feet, and the hallux uh, baris deformity. Then on the left, uh, you see the knee joint effusion. Uh, uh, that's the right knee, actually. And this is uh, an important thing that you might encounter the classic nodule under the elbow. These nodules can occur in many other places, including the fingers, uh, in the base of the skull, and then in weight-bearing areas sometimes, and then also in this presacral area. These nodules are very important because they uh, uh, signify severe disease and the risk of vasculitis and extra manifestations. And sometimes they can ulcerate and get infected. So if they are, uh, cumbersome or they are causing difficulty for the patient or they're frequently getting infected, it might, be, uh, it, might be, it might be worth excising them. But many times they can come back with the activity of the disease. One important uh, pearl, clinical pearl that I want to share with you is there are patients you may have seen who are on long-term methotrexate who get nodules. The mechanism of that nodule is different from that of uh, the rheumatoid nodule. And these are not usually uh, reversible unless you stop the methotrexate very early. Palpable purpura, hallmark of the vasculitic uh, changes, uh, non thrombocytopenic. The legs, and this is early sign of vasculitis in the angle area, preangle area, that small vessel disease, and a little bit more advanced in the digital infarction, ulceration, significant gangrene. So this is a very aggressive part of the disease, which we seldom see today because of early aggressive intervention. Pyoderma gangrenosum. This is a skin disease which you may encounter from time to time in your practice. If you see one, is it usually about the medial malleolus of the ankle? It can happen in different clinical settings. One important setting is rheumatoid arthritis, which is uncontrolled. Uh, it can happen in uh, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And uh, this is a very important uh, thing to treat aggressively because it can destroy the whole underlying tissues there. And one of the things you should not do in the pyoderma ganglionosis is try to debride it. The more you debride, the more it will recur uh, and become more aggressive. And the treatment today of this disease, whether you have it in association with RA or otherwise, is use of biologics along with drugs like uh, uh, methotrexate or uh, azotyprin. Episcleritis, this is not as bad. This is much more so because this is more extensive around the cornea and leading to corneal ulcerations. Now, very important for you to remember, if you see uveitis, it is less likely to be rheumatoid. Uveitis usually signifies psoriatic arthritis or a seronegative spondyloarthropathy like ankylosing spondylitis. 
no test is pathognomonic, but you have to screen uh, patients for some of the tests, which are in the three categories, marking inflammation, which is ESR, C-reactive protein, and the complete blood count, then the hematological and immunological parameters. I told you the C-reactive protein is very much more useful in following inflammation than the SED rate. Uh, you can do both in a given patient. And one important point, again, it's a clinical pearl. If a person who's on biologics or immunosuppressive drugs in RA who's treated and gets an infection, the C-reactive protein might increase a hundred or thousand fold compared to the time and there's inflammation. So CRP it has a more discerning value, both in rheumatoid and in lupus. And then anemia, leukopenia, other things you can follow, thrombocytopenia. Now, rheumatoid factor, I say, the anti-nuclear antibody uh, need not be done routinely in every patient with rheumatoid arthritis because it'll be falsely positive sometimes. But if you do get a positive ANA, look for evidence of other autoantibodies, part of a mixed connective tissue disease spectrum. And then the ACP, CCP antibody is probably the most important. Now, since there are no other good ways of assessing the disease, what you do is you count the joints involved, then combine it with a positive negative serology, and then the acute phase reactants, and how long the disease has lasted. Now, usually by the American College of Rheumatology definition, you don't diagnose RA until six weeks have elapsed from the time the disease started because viral syndromes can mimic RA. If there's persistence beyond six weeks, think RA. And uh, then you get a score with all this. Don't worry about it too much. And there are several indices which have been the DAS index, the SDI, CDAI. These are done by rheumatologists looking at patient function, patient pain, global pain, as assessed by the patient, by the physician, tender joints, solar joints, and the phase reactants. Then you get to a composite score. And if the score declines with treatment, you know the patient is improving. X-rays are most important uh, tool in imaging these disease early and in early stages, nothing may be found. And that's exactly when you want to start treating them. And uh, this is widespread osteopenia here. The bones are thin and there's cartilage loss already in some areas. And you see there is, this is in a patient with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and adult disease is almost very similar. So once you see changes, the disease is progressing. And uh, these are the stages where you see erosions here. Now, patients with ILD, with cystic formation here, the central lobular emphysema, very classic, but this is more advanced. I'm just showing you a few things about the systemic manifestations. This is pericardial effusion with a classic right atrial diastolic collapse, and then the presence of fluid there. It can result in tamponade. Now, differential diagnosis. Most common thing in a young person who's got multiple aches and pains will be fibromyalgia, but they don't have the synovitis. They usually have pain, depression, and fatigue. Rheumatoid patients will also have fatigue. And if you are in an area where Lyme disease, like in the Northeast, you could think that if there's a history of a tick bite. Osteoarthritis in middle-aged women may mimic, but the distribution of joints affected are more distal. And then shoulders, ankles, elbows are not usually affected unless uh, there's been trauma. And rheumatoid, osteoarthritis earlier on is not as symmetric as rheumatoid. And then psoriatic arthritis can be a mimic, but psoriatic arthritis very often will cause a spondyl arthropathy in addition. Sarcoid can mimic, but it's less deforming. Lupus can mimic RA, but it's not deforming. And you have other features of the disease. Now, that uh, gets us into the territory of the pharmacological therapy, which is very important in managing this patient. So the goal of treatment today is to induce complete remission as possible, as early as possible. The mantra being elimination of synovitis equals elimination of joint destruction. So saving cartilage is of the essence. Time is cartilage <laughs> in early rheumatoid arthritis. Like in septic arthritis, time is of the essence. Time is cartilage, just like cardiologists call it. Time is of the essence saving muscle in the heart. <laughs> so remember that, that's a modern mantra. Now, this is a classic therapeutic paradigm which I've been using for the last 40 years. What is important for you to remember is at the bottom of the pyramid or all the old 
modalities of treatment like salicylates, NSAIDs, and so on. In the middle, we had the DMARDs, which were there for the last 30, 40 years, which also we are familiar with, methotrexate, uh, azotyperin, uh, and so on, hydroxychloroquine. Then we added leflunomide. But what you have to remember is the apex, the new drugs, the D biologic DMARDs, then supported on the site with uh, frequent uh, short-term dosing of corticosteroids and assisted by physical therapy, occupational therapy, and surgery in a few instances. Now, this was the original pyramid. Now, the modern uh, uh, way of looking at this pyramid is you invert the pyramid early. Inversion of the pyramid, therapeutic pyramid is what we do now. Start aggressively early. So the optimal care includes pharmacological and non-pharmacological. The non-pharmacological, we won't get into too much detail, you're familiar with it. Exercise earlier on, passive and active range of motion, uh, a diet which is healthy for the patient from a cardiovascular standpoint and otherwise, massages, uh, heat treatments, cold treatments, depending on the acuteness of the pain, counseling, stress reduction, and then occupational therapy with some short-term bracing or uh, splints, but not uh, long-term, and then surgery, very minimal. And then involve the patient and their family so that the family can help these patients. And if, uh, especially the patient is married, the spouse has to be actively involved. And if the patient is unmarried, the, the, other, the, the, the parents will have to be involved uh, in helping this patient in the long-term management. Now, medication, I'll get into more de details later, is to pretend uh, uh, to cause retardation uh, of disease progression. The early treatment improves quality of life outcome. Now, as the disease is treated aggressively, you feel that there's less and less need for orthopedic interventions, number one. Number two, premature deaths from cardiovascular diseases has declined because these biologics have effects on lipids also, and thereby preventing accelerated atherogenesis. Now, some special situations where a woman gets pregnant with rheumatoid, many of them may do better with pregnancy because there's a lot of corticosteroids in circulation during pregnancy, which may help them get into remission, but not all of them are that exceptionally lucky. So then it creates some issues, but these patients can be followed like anybody else uh, uh, who's undergoing pregnancy with some observations here and there by the uh, specialist in obstetrics, the perinatologist, and the medications that the patient might have to use has to be thought of very carefully. Less medicine during pregnancy is always ideal, but every person is not lucky. So they have aggressive disease during pregnancy. You have to watch them more carefully. Now, so the non-steroidal drugs are the mainstay in early uh, the stage of the disease controlling inflammation. They don't have any effects on progression of the disease. The non-pharmacological we alluded to. Glucocorticoids are used in tandem. Uh, early phases uh, to control the inflammation, but you back off very quickly. And the center stage is on the disease-modifying drugs. The older ones, methotrexate and leflunomide, currently new, and hydroxychloroquine, along with the biologics. So that is the most important slide that you need to remember. And we'll go through some of these things. Now, this again shows you the extensive array of cytokines which have been targeted in rheumatoid arthritis. And with rheumatoid arthritis, remember the TNF-alpha targeted therapy, IL-6 targeted therapy, IL-1 targeted therapy, T cell and B cell, and the JAK inhibitor therapy. All of these will I'll allude to later. Rank ligand inhibition comes when you aggressively treat the disease early to prevent osteoporosis. And then GM-CSF inhibition, particularly involved in Felties, where you want to raise the neutrophil count, prevent recurrent infections and ulcerations in the skin. Now, this is a panoply of drugs, uh, both synthetic and biological. The synthetic ones you're familiar with, uh, hydroxychloroquine, probably the oldest one, sulfur salicy in the next, then methotrexate in this country. In uh, the UK, they also use azotyperin. Then in the synthetic, there are targeted ones which are new, and that is the JAK inhibitors. Most important one is tofacitinib and barcitinib, then there's upacitinib. So 
the TNF is the most important cytokine. It accounts for, for 50 to 60 percent of all the damage which occurs in RA. And the first drug most of you are familiar with is Enbrel, which is HNR recept. Then the monoclonal antibodies, infliximab. Then you have adalimumab, which is Acumira, Remicade. Then you have Lolimumab and Cetilimumab. And then uh, that's the big chunk of drugs which are used. And then the IL-6, you probably need to remember Tocluzumab, uh, which is a different cytokine. It has gained a lot of uh, prominence, I would say, besides rheumatoid. But now it's also a treatment of uh, choice in steroid resistant patients with giant cell arteritis. Now, and in the COVID uh, era, the IL-6 uh, drugs have been used in patients who have been affected by the cytokine storm uh, and where some patients' uh, lives have been saved by early use of tocilizumab. B cell depletion, B cells are very, very important in causing most of the damage in RA. Rituximab is a, a, a drug used in oncology which works on the CD20 population. B cells, very important. And then T cells, which drive the B cells, can be blocked by the CD80 ligand, that is the abatisept. So this is a slide which you may broadly want to remember. Um, and these are the side effects which you'll see. The conventional ones, the old ones, mainly blood counts going down, rash, nausea, stomatitis with methotrexate, hair loss with methotrexate and plaquenil, liver damage with leflunomide and methotrexate. Targeted therapies like the uh, JAK inhibitors, you have to watch the cholesterol levels and liver uh, effects, and then cytopenia and herpes zoster. The biologics, reactivation of TB, very important sometimes occurrence of deep fun fungal infections like blasto, crypto, if they're in endemic areas, patients are in endemic areas. Elevation of cholesterol, liver damage, cytopenia. In psoriasis, it may aggravate psoriasis uh, lesion sometimes adversely. Bowel perforation can occur with IL-6 inhibitors, especially if they're on steroids, it can be masked. Flare-up of multiple sclerosis, aggravation of heart problems, especially if they are in stage three or four, and just a heart failure should withhold these drugs, uh, and then drug-induced lupus. Many of them may have a positive ANA, that is not a reason to stop the drug, but drug-induced lupus, you may have stopped the drug. Now, the, uh, we'll skip some of these next slides that you don't need to know all that yet. Now, the important thing is you have to minimize the pain, stiffness, inflammation, and complications. Now, with the biological treatments, what they have found so far is etinoreceptin and rituximab are the most effective uh, in patients who have never taken any other anti rheumatic drugs. But it doesn't mean others are not effective. So let's talk a little bit about the traditional ones. Hydroxychloroquine uh, can be used along with methotrexate and sulfasalazine. That's called the triple therapy. Uh, it takes time, three to six months, to become effective. There's no evidence of halting the radiographic progression with these drugs. The sulfasalazine, most po more popular in Europe than in this country, is all useful for mild to moderate disease. It can be used in combination with the new drugs and very slow in acting. If somebody's allergic to sulfur, you should avoid sulfasalazine. If a young patient wants to plan a family, you should stop sulfasalazine. Uh, not only in the if it's a female patient, uh, three months before they plan on pregnancy, and you should also tell the male spouse to stop sulfasalazine if he's on, because sulfasalazine in the man may cause azospermia. So methotrexate has become the cornerstone of treatment uh, along the biologicals. It's a well-tolerated once a weekly medication orally or as a sub-Q injection. Again, not it's contraindicated in childbearing women, and it has to be administered with folic acid supplementation. Leflunomide is almost very similar to methotrexate, but works on the primidines. Uh, and uh, this is, again, these two drugs are for moderate to severe disease. It does slow progression radiologically, but uh, again, they can irritate the liver. And in the early stages, these drugs may cause uh, acute pneumonitis, which has to be watched very carefully. Now, Combination therapies prior to the onset of biologics, 
was the combination of hydroxychloroquine methotrexate, HCQ with sulfasalazine, methotrexate plus nafilunamide, sulfasalazine plus methotrexate, and then all the three drugs. The triple therapy was effective in a lot of patients. And even now there are some studies which say that they may be very close in effectiveness to the, uh, in comparison to the biologics. But one combination I would refrain from is the combination of methotrexate and leflunamide because it's highly epitotoxic. Now, the important thing of instituting either the conventional DMARDs or the biological DMARDs is over a period of time, three to six months, patients may be able to take less of the NSAIDs or pain medications or even steroids. That is the most important uh, advantage, and besides the other advantages of the biologics, which I alluded to. Now, the treatment, early treatment in RA means before six months after the onset of symptoms. So you might want to institute methotrexate day one, that you see the patient before the first six months. And today, many patients uh, are put on even methotrexate plus Enbrel or one of the newer drugs, uh, depending on their tolerability or the uh, response. And that is aggressive treatment. And as the patient proceeds on this treatment, even the methotrexate dosing can be reduced. And uh, the dosing of the uh, biologics can be reduced. Patients can be completely off steroids. And many of these patients can be asked to continue the medicines for a period of time. And in Europe, in particular, they're even looking at a drug holiday, but that's not possible in many patients because the, drug, uh, the disease will relapse, but that can always be controlled by short bursts of steroids. And uh, the reason holidays are important, one, we reduce the risk of infection uh, and any potential risk of malignancy, but also importantly, cost saving. Uh, biologics are very expensive. And now they have biosimilars, which I'll talk to you later, which has reduced the cost by half. Now, other treatments like gold has been completely uh, replaced. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about some other non biologic Minocycline has been used for a long time as an antibiotic. It works on the metalloproteinase inhibitor matrix, MMPI, not very popular because it can cause a lot of autoimmune syndromes and also cause sometimes uh, uh, vestibular disturbances and pigmentation in the skin, which uh, will not be reversible. So that is a very important uh, uh, thing to remember. Now, the TNF, Enbrel is the time old one, about 20 years old. Uh, it's given as a sub-Q injection, Inflix Max and IV infusion takes two, uh, two hours. Humira is sub-Q, Simzia is sub-Q, Golimumab is sub-Q. The cost goes up. Enbrel is a more cheaper version of it. This is more expensive, more expensive, and these are very expensive. Now, expense should not drive your decision to use these drugs. The patient needs it with the aggressive disease. You use these drugs uh, uh, early. Now, Enbrel is safe from the point of view, less TB recrudescence has been noted with Enbrel, whereas the others have a little bit more risk. Now, with the IV infused drug, infliximab, particularly, and adalimumab, these are all monoclonal antibodies, whereas Enbrel is working on the uh, TNF receptor. Now, the monoclonal antibodies, the problem is many of them are close to human monoclonal antibodies, but sometimes they have a murine component, especially infliximab. So you can get anti chimeric antibodies, which may negate the effect of the drug over a period of time. That's why combining them with methotrexate will eliminate the anti-chimeric antibodies. Now, it's also been shown that combination of methotrexate and a biologic has provides the best response than using either drug alone. Now, these are the new biosimilars which are available in some countries. And uh, the FDA has approved ones for the Humira, Remicade, and Enbrel. And these are about half the cost. Let's say the original Enbrel costs $15,000 a year per patient. This will cost about $8,000. Remicade, $30,000 original, $15,000 for the biosimilar. Biosimilars seem to be working as effectively and only time will tell. The US has been very slow in adjusting to the biosimilars compared to many other advanced countries in the Western hemisphere. 
And these are some of the biosimilars in pandemic eight. And uh, these are the tocilizumab, actimab, these don't have biosimilars. Serilumab is not as widely used, but tocilizumab is used, orenzia or abetacept is used. This can be sub-Q or infusion. Rituximab is an infusion weekly, once for four weeks. These are the JAK inhibitors. These have revolutionized treatment in the biologics because all of them are oral and once a day. So it's more acceptable to patients. Now, the side effects I told you with these uh, biologics, uh, mainly the tuberculosis and chronic fungal disease should be watched for. If somebody lives in a fungal, fungus prone area in, in California, particularly if you are in the central California area, crypto, uh, the, uh, the coccidiomycosis is a problem. If you're in the Ohio, uh, Michigan area, histoplasmosis. And if you're in the Florida area, blastomycosis. So you have to be aware of this. It can get reactivated. TB is the most important one. If you're dealing with a patient who is from a TB uh, prone area, like South Asia, India, China, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, or Southeast Asia, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, China, all these areas, Thailand, and then people from Africa or South America. Now, if somebody has demyelinating disorder, try to avoid these drugs. Now, if somebody's stage three or four CHF, according to the Killips, uh, New York, heart associated classification, avoid these drugs because they may worsen the uh, condition. Now, anytime you use a biologic, you should do a PPD testing, preferably an interferon gamma release assay, preferably also with chest radiography. Uh, and then if you find somebody positive on a PPD or gamma uh, IGRA positive, if normally anything below 10 is considered negative, but for purposes of starting a biologic, even if they're five millimeter positive, you should, with induration, just not erythema, just in erythema plus induration, you should put them on uh, uh, INH uh, 300 milligrams daily for nine months. You can start it first for a month, see, make sure whether they are having any hepatotoxicity. toxicity. If they are not, after uh, month one, you can continue uh, using the biologic with it. Now, and follow it. Now, every time a patient with rheumatoid who's on biologics goes to a TB prone area, they come back, make sure that you make sure they've not had any TB infection. Maybe once you check the uh, uh, PPD or the gamma release assay or a chest x ray. Now, what is very uh, frightening about TB vis a vis biologics is many patients who got TB with during biologic, uh, biological therapy developed extra pulmonary disease, which is much, much more hard to diagnose and can be fatal. And many have ended up with miliary TB and died. Fortunately, it's not a big risk if you're uh, watchful. Now, very important, prior to starting DMARDS, it's good to give vaccines. If you have a month ahead, you can wait, give them, you know, the, uh, uh, old uh, uh, HCV vaccine was okay. Now you have to have two shots that creates a problem. Yellow fever, if it's four to six weeks ahead of time, you can uh, give it. Live vaccine should be used very, very carefully uh, when you're on this. And uh, the other important thing is besides biologic, if somebody is on more than seven and a half milligrams weekly of methotrexate or more than 20 milligrams of uh, prednisone, uh, you should be careful giving vaccination to this patient. Now, attenuated non-live vaccines, influenza pneumococcal, DTPV, H hepatitis B vaccines are safe and they can be given while patients are on these drugs. Now, the new HCV shingles is not contraindicated, but again, you have to stop the drug for four weeks if you want to get the second shot of the shingles. Now, hepatitis B can get reactivated. So if you have hepatitis B infection in somebody, uh, you have to watch that very carefully if they, they have the surface antigen. And sometimes you may have to, in consultation with the ID folks and GI, put them on treatment and continue the treatment with the biologics. Now, the other important things. Uh, 
biologics in terms of malignancy. Somebody gets a cancer, which is not a lymphoma, why on biologics? Can you continue the treatment with biologics? Most oncologists will let you do it as long as the cancer is in remission. And uh, there's not a problem. With lymphoma, you cannot use the conventional one except rituximab. Okay. Now, I want to give you a little bit of an idea about how this TNF brings about so much damage through the macrophage, B cell, synovial lines, and activate T cell. And uh, this is a key player here in rheumatoid and works on the osteoclast, the synovial site, and the chondrocyte. So you blunt all these responses when you use biologics early, and the results are very clear. Now, uh, let's keep going. Methotrexate alone or TNF inhibitors alone are not as effective. That's a very important point for you to remember. These can also be used along with sulfasalazine or hydroxychloroquine. Then, these drugs, you don't need to know a lot. You can read from your slides. They all are very similar to Enbrel and uh, their uh, other cousin, Infliximab or Humira. So we don't need to worry about it. We go to the next important group of drugs, Rituximab, which works on the CD20 clone and causes lysis of the B cell. And that is Rituximab, which is a very effective uh, drug. Uh, but when you use this drug, you use it along with methotrexate or corticosteroids or hydroxychloroquine. There's no problem. You cannot combine two biologics at any time because of high risk of infection and death. Now, these are reserved for patients who did not respond to the TNF inhibitors earlier on. So that's very important. Now, don't worry about all these. Now, IL-1 inhibition was the original one which started the biologic revolution. There's a busy uh, drug called anakindra, which is a sub-Q injection. The one good thing about this drug is that it's free from any reactivation of TB. That risk is not there. And it has been superseded by the other TNF inhibitors because it's not as effective. Now, the only use of IL-1 inhibition, anakindra, is now in resistant gout, which I'll talk to in the next uh, lecture, to prevent an acute attack when it's resistant to steroids. Now, this brings us to the T-cell uh, driving mechanism through the CD86 uh, ligand, where it prevents B-cells from uh, being activated by the T-cell. There's only one drug, which is Orenzia, or abitacept. And it's as effective as the chain of inhibitors, uh, either as an intravenous infusion or a sub-Q injection. Okay. Now, are all these created equal? Most of them, the chain of inhibitors are all created equal. Now, the, uh, you may go from one to another if one, you don't get a response. Now, after three months to six months, maximum you can wait with each biologist about six months. The disease is aggressive. You can even go to the next one in three months. Now, if you have tried two from the same class, TNF class, there's no point in continuing working your way through all the five or six products available. It's better to switch to an IL-6 or an anti-B cell or an anti-T cell or a JAK. That's the message I want you to understand. Now, tecuzumab is preferred when you cannot use TNF inhibitors, rituximab or abitacept or uh, uh, or a JAK inhibitor. The reason for that is it's not been widely used as much. It blocks the IL-6 pathway and serolumab is its cousin, not as widely used. So the idea is the TNFs, rituximab, abitacept, and JAK are the mainstays of treatment now. And IL-6 you keep in reserve. Now, don't worry about the signaling pathway. You know, it's uh, too much information important drug, tofacitinib. This is a JAK kinase, which has been used in oncology in the inhibitors, a group of intracellular tyrosine kinase that transmits signals from cytokine or growth factor receptors interact with cell membrane to influence cellular processes and immune function. So tofacitinib is the first one which was uh, released and very popular and uh, is effective along uh, with methotrexate or leflunamide. So it's the first one approved in 2012. Now, monotherapy is not as effective as combination therapy with methotrexate. And a significant improvement uh, in a dose five milligrams twice daily, 
And now there's an extended release, 11 milligrams daily, approved in February 2016 by the FDA. Don't worry about barcitinib. It's not as popular as tofacitinib, but it's, it can be used in people who cannot tolerate tofacitinib. The one advantage with JAK inhibitors, it's widely preferred by patients because it's oral, like methotrexate. And the important class-related uh, side effect is the remote possibility of DVT in these patients. So if you have a patient who's at risk for DVT, deep vein thrombosis, you cannot use this drug if you can avoid it. And especially patients who may have other risk factors for DVT, very severely obese, CHF patients, of course, you will not be using many of these drugs anyway. Or patients who have an anti-cardiolipin antibody syndrome avoid uh, this uh, class of drugs. Effectiveness of these three drugs, opadacitinib is the third one. Some of these uh, are uh, have very similar effectiveness and side effects. Again, not as good as monotherapy, better in combination therapy. Now, the so when you start these drugs, increase the dose of medication gradually, then switch uh, to some other DMARD in association with this biologics and switch the dosing frequently, and then getting into combination therapy early. That's the mantra. Now, combination therapy with all these drugs I told you, which were originally there, the non-biologics, uh, we have found that some of the triple therapy patients uh, responded very well. Uh, uh, there are some studies which say that they came close to the use of biologic with methotrexate. So that's again a debatable point, but if they're responding to a less expensive combination non-biologic therapy, why not use it? it it's a, entirely the judgment of the uh, physician. Dr. Venkat, just yeah. really quickly, we're at almost 57 minutes past the hour, so I don't okay. know if we have a- Okay, I'm going to get into one or two more things. Okay. The hydroxychloroquine, you have to follow with the ophthalmologist regularly uh, once in a year. Uh, these steroids, I wanted to make sure that you know a little bit about steroids as burst therapy and tapering them, like 20 milligrams initially, and then tapering it down to five milligrams uh, daily. Every other day doesn't work. And then you have side effects if you exceed the dose of seven and a half milligrams daily for more than six months, especially osteoporosis and risk of fractures and other coexisting infections. Now, the COX-2s are not any better than NSAIDs for pain. The only one, Coxib, is used. Again, they have the same risk in terms of uh, liver toxicity and uh, kidney toxicity. And one more thing, important thing is, okay. Now, the guidelines basically will tell you the same thing. Methotrexate alone is not as effective. Methotrexate plus TNF inhibitor or one of the biologics is effective. Now you can use HCQ, that's hydroxychloroquine, in addition if you want to. And then NSAIDs and steroids can be tapered down. Sulfasalazine is probably not as effective as methotrexate or lefronamide, but some studies show that they can be used over methotrexate in combination with the biologic. So all this is uh, uh, subject to a lot of uh, controversy. Now, uh, the important thing is rheumatoid nodules we alluded to. Lung disease, if it occurs, it's a contraindication for long-term use of biologics or methotrexate or leflunamide. Now, I alluded to Live, uh, heart failure, liver failure, hepatitis B activation, you may have to stop these drugs if they're not responding to the uh, treatment. Now, the most important thing, hepatitis C, with the new treatments available, it should not be a difficult one to continue treatment of the biologics. Malignancy, solid malignancy is not a contraindication to stop the medicine. Lymphoma is, but you can switch to rituximab as long as the non- uh, lymphoma malignancies are stable, you can, with the permission of the oncologist, continue using this. Now, Felty syndrome, actually you can use these drugs, even though they have other risk factors with pancytopenia, as long as they're not infected. TB, I already told you that one important thing is uh, carpal tunnel syndrome with RA is not a big issue. You treat them conservatively with injection, corticosteroid injection, or splint. Then, 
used during pregnancy. Now, that's an important one. You cannot use methotrexate, period. You cannot use leflunamide. Now, anakindra, rituximab, abidacept, uh, stofacinib can be used as long as you're followed by a rheumatologist and uh, with permission from the OB people. Now, the safest biologic is Simzia, which is not a very commonly used TNF inhibitor, low risk of crossing a placenta in breast milk. So always remember pregnancy is a complicated situation. Okay, one last thing about steroids with the new uh, treatment uh, recommendations. Today, the idea is not to use long-term steroids, basically. That's the whole idea behind stepping in with these new drugs and the conventional DMARDs. So as much as possible, early within the first three months, we can stop steroids, good, use NSAIDs intermittently. And even NSAIDs, you have to be very careful if it's a diabetic or hypertensive because it can aggravate kidney disease. And then CHF, you have to be very, very careful. And so, and watch for any ulcerations in the GI tract. So all of these should be tapered down quickly uh, because of early interventions with the biologics. So that's the basic, uh, 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 basic message that I want to get. Early intervention with uh, DMARTs and bio-DMARTs in combination, watch for infections, watch for malignancy, CHF, use in pregnancy we have alluded to, early stoppage or discontinuation of steroids, and if possible, early tapering of NSAIDs unless used as needed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Venka. I know there's a lot of information to cover in right. a very short right. amount of time. Right. And all of the, whatever I might have missed uh, because of time, all of it is in the slides. And uh, it, this is pretty much uh, all the information that will help you when you're dealing with patients. Because I wanted to bring this up to you as primary care providers. You may be following these patients with your rheumatologist. And many times you may end up seeing a patient for an infection or aggravation of heart failure or TB. You need to know all this. And you may be dealing with a pregnant patient along with the rheumatologist and the obstetrician. So you need to be aware of these so that you can get to the specialists early and talk to them. So, okay. That's great. Yes, I think what we'll do in the interest of time, I did receive two questions about rheumatoid arthritis, but I think yeah. what we'll do is, why don't we move right into the gout presentation? Yeah, sure. um, if Thank we have you. time I'm to get to the gout a little bit faster. Let me. Now, how do I close this now? Uh, you can uh, hit the escape button. That should get you out of there. Uh, if, which button? Or just end show, yep. Oh, end show, okay. And if you aren't able to stay on till the end of the gout presentation for the Q&A, what I will do is feel free to send me your questions via chat, either in the group chat or privately. And yeah, I and I can, you can send me an email. I can give you my email uh, if you guys want. I, I can... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll email you all the questions, Dr. Venkat, and what I'll do uh, is I'll compile the answers. Yeah, yeah sure. I'll, I'll be happy to. And even you can, uh, you know, uh, if anybody wants to call me, give me my personal cell number. That's not a problem. Delay in closing this thing. Let me, okay, it's closing now. Uh, okay, let me go to the next slide collection. Wait a minute, boy. Yeah, so while you're doing that, just to reiterate, we're moving on now to our second topic of the day today, which is gout. Um, so Dr. Venkat will pull up his slides, we'll move into that same scenario. If you wanna send me questions that you have throughout the um, presentation, I'm happy to uh, spend some time doing Q&A at the end of the presentation, but I know we have a back-to-back -back, um, four sessions on rheumatology, so a lot of you may need to move to those sessions. So what I will do is if we don't have time to answer any of the questions, I'll send the questions to Dr. Venkat um, separately, okay. get his uh, responses and distribute okay. those. Now, uh, Meredith, I have a thing which comes on front screen, uh, screen a stop sh shared window is closed. It's okay, press okay. Yeah. Hit okay, okay. and then okay. you have and to then share your now, screen. Yeah, right. Now share screen again, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, good. Let me... Okay, so this it. is a talk on gout. Is that uh, switching gears? Totally different uh, entity. <laughs> okay, and uh, let me see here. 
Okay. Uh, basically, we're going to talk the same things about gout that we did for RA in terms of the disease itself and understanding the current knowledge of, about hyperuricemia, which will help you understand the treatment modalities. There's a lot of new stuff on gout. It's a disorder of metabolism. So it's a, a, a metabolic disease in some ways because a lot of uric acid or urate accumulated blood and tissues. It's an inflammatory crystalline arthropathy. That's an important statement. It's an inflammatory arthropathy. It's a crystalline arthropathy. It can be both acute and chronic. The elevated serum music acid levels are the principal reason why somebody develops gout. But interestingly enough, during the early stage of acute gout, someone can have normal uric acid levels in the serum. So remember that. So it progresses over time. Now, when tissues become supersaturated, the urate salts precipitate, forming the crystals of monosodium urate, which I'll refer to many times as MSU in the slide. The presence of urate crystals in the soft tissue and synovial tissues is a prerequisite or a sine qua non for a gouty attack. So if left untreated, the disorder can lead to joint destruction over a period of time uh, in the same way rheumatoid does. And in the case of uric acid crystals also cause renal damage in addition because they can go and plug up the uh, glomeruli in the tubules. Now, gout is prevalent about 5.9% of men and 2% in women. Now, very important statement, in a premenopausal women, it's much rarer than in, in, in the same age group as in men. The reason for that, the estrogenic hormones in women have a mild uricosuric effect, and uh, that prevents them from getting gout, usually in the premenopausal stage of their life, unless there are other risk factors, which may be genetic due to an enzyme deficiency, or they're extremely obese, uh, they have uh, heavy uh, intake of alcohol, uh, and uh, also uh, they have other uh, factors like chronic kidney disease and so on. The predominant age range for gout is about 30 to 60 years. Now, gout is much more common in postmenopausal women. And it's a very uh, difficult diagnosis to make sometimes in postmenopausal women because it can mimic rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, usually, uric acid levels are elevated for 10 to 20 years before somebody gets gout. Very important uh, statement to remember. Now, the disease burden of gout is substantial and it's increasing. Uh, by leaps and bounds in the Western countries and even in the developing countries of the world, because they are getting more westernized, if I might use that expression, suggesting the existence of a modern gout epidemic that is analogous to the obesity epidemic. So we thought we conquered gout 40 years ago when we had uh, new drugs like allopurinol, but uh, it still remains uh, the appellation, the king of diseases. <laughs> it used to be called the disease of kings, the king of diseases. Uh, among middle-aged men, hyperuricemia is a significant independent risk factor for death from cardiovascular disease. Now, uh, to most of you who are in primary care taking uh, care of a lot of difficult patients and the forefront of healthcare, when you see a patient with high uric acid, which is even asymptomatic, but who confronts you, in your deep inside you think metabolic syndrome. If the patient is slightly overweight, they have a borderline hypertension, borderline diabetes, think metabolic syndrome. Watch these guys carefully because it's not the gout which is important. They could die from heart disease early, just like what I alluded to with RA. So the meta-analysis found independent associated with gout and cardiovascular mortality as an all-cost mortality. Now, healthcare costs related to gout that has been staggering over the years. And what has happened is, when I was a fellow 40 years ago, that gives out my age, unfortunately, we knew a lot more about gout. We saw a lot more gout. But in the modern era, for about 10, 20 years, in the 60s and 70s, 80s, we saw less gout. Now it's spiraling out of control. And uh, the younger generation of physicians have not seen that much gout. And so, difficulties in early diagnosis and mistakes committed in treating acute gout or following chronic gout has created a bigger problem. And that adds to the healthcare cost because these patients will end up in the emergency room all the time and uh, go from physician to physician, not getting an answer. And since this disease sometimes needs long-term treatment, 
patient's compliance is also not good. Now, this is a very important uh, slide, uh, how uric acid occurs. Ribose 5-phosphate, PRPP glutamine, there's an enzyme PRPP synthetase, very important enzyme. Then you get adenylic acid, inosinic acid, guanylic acid, gives you the adenine, hyposanthine, and guanine. The key step is hyposanthine to xanthine, and xanthine to uric acid with this xanthine oxidase control, very key step. And then uric acid acted upon by uricase causes allantoin. Allantoin does not cause problem. If you have allantoin, you're, been, you're free from gout. Now that raises a question, why human beings get gout, all the other species don't. All the other species retain the ability to have uricase convert uric acid to allantoin if you believe in the Darwinian uh, theories of evolution. Now, man lost it at some point. Now, Dalmatians also get gout. So Dalmatians have been an animal model to study gout. So very interesting. Now, this is something new. There are now transporters in the kidney and intestines in humans which contribute to elevations of uric acid or to keep the uric acid normal, the normal uric acid homeostasis. Now, most of the uric acid is uh, ex secreted, excreted by the kidney and reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. And the one which increases uh, uric acid back up into the system is URAT1. And uh, you see on the top here in blue, URAT1. Now, if you look at the intestine, probably 5% of the uh, uric acid excretion, there is uh, now evidence that uh, th there is some enzyme systems which drives uh, urate out of the blood uh, uh, through intestinal mechanisms also. These will have future implications in treatment, but at least remember that. The cascade, urate centipedes, hyperuricemia is anything over six milligrams per deciliter. And the sources of urate in the body, tissue, nucleic acids, dietary purines, the overproduction side and endogenous purine synthesis, then the under excretion side. Now, silent tissue deposition occurs the longer uric acid uh, is elevated in the blood, then the clinical stage of gout becomes obvious. The gout is sustained, renal manifestations, and long term cardiovascular events and mortality. Now, it'd be interesting that uh, most patients who have gout have gout because they're under excretors. But there's a sizable population of people who uh, indulge in very rich food or heavy uh, uh, drinkers of alcohol, especially beer, could have a overproduction as well. So the modern ways of living has contributed to a resurgence of gout, in some, if you put it another way. So gout is either primary or secondary. Primary gout is really under excretion or overproduction, or the overproduction can be due to a uh, malfunctioning PRPP synthetase uh, enzyme, as I alluded to on the slide. The mix of dietary excess or alcohol or use in part of the metabolic syndrome. Now, secondary gout is due to some other disease. So when you treat cancer, cancer cells generate a lot of uric acid uh, due to purine synthesis. And uh, either the disease itself or the treatment. That's why when you treat patients in oncology, uh, there's a heavy uh, load of uh, uric acid. They prophylactically treat them for the high uric acid along the chemotherapy. And then things that we use and practice most commonly uh, uh, diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide increases uric acid. Uh, other loop diuretics like uh, Lasix or Pyrozimide to a lesser extent. Renal failure uh, accounts for a lot of hyperuricemia, renal tubular disorders, Lead poisoning. In, in days gone by in this country, uh, in the South, people used to drink moonshine uh, and, uh, you know, distilling alcohol through car, car radiators or lead lined uh, uh, systems. And the lead poisoning, in addition, caused the damage to the kidney. It's called Saturnine gout. We don't see it as often now uh, uh, as, as, since the days of bootlegging was uh, prevalent. Hyperproduced skin disorder, psoriasis. You have a heavy turnover of epidermal cells which causes hyperuricemia. But most of the time, patients with psoriasis do not get gout. They have hyperuricemia. Again, another important point to make, all hyperuricemia does not lead to gout. 
and acute gout may not be associated early on with hyperuricemia. Now, other uh, enzyme defects I told you, uh, which uh, are important in very rare instances. There's a syndrome called Leshnihan syndrome. If any of you see children in your practice, it is due to the hypoxanthine guanine fibrobosyl, uh, ribosyl transferase, HGPRT enzyme, causes Leshnihan syndrome deficiency. They get hyperuricemia before the age of two, and this damage is a central nervous system causing, co causing choreoathetosis, and they auto-mutilate, they chew up their own digits, and they have death usually before two or three years of age. Very uh, sad disease to deal with. Now, this is a very important slide. On my left, you see the metabolic changes, increased uh, free fatty acids, then the complement coating of the MSCO crystals, lipopolysaccharide increase, bacterial infection causes the lipopolysaccharide increase. Now, how they converge into this thing called the NLRP3 is called inflazone, which is occurring inside the cell. And due to a number of reactions, including IL-1 beta, that's the cytokine, IL-1 beta all along and pro-IL-1 beta 1, then the uh, reaction with active capsase 1, that's an important enzyme. All this causes the acute inflammatory reaction. The uptake of the complement coated MSU crystals by the neutrophil, the release of IL-8, by the interaction. And then the important uh, thing, which is uh, causing the reaction uh, with anti inflammatory factors, IL 1RA, IL 37, 10. What most important thing you remember is the IL 16RA, and then the IL 1 beta causes the activation. So there's initial, uh, this part, portion is when you get the acute reaction, and slowly it resolves and hits the baseline. Now, again, when the crystals are gobbled up, there's a chemotaxis occurring inside the PMN, release of TNF-alpha, IL-168, then the complement activation, the cells and the uh, microtubules in the cell fights with the crystals. Now, that releases lysosomal enzymes, free radicals of prostaglandin, then there are proteases which are involved. That's the acute Gaudi reaction. And this is... Uh, the uh, so-called inflammasome. Now, when you look at the progression of disease in gout, no disease, asymptomatic disease, symptomatic disease with complications. So it's very self explanatory normal uricemia, hyperuricemia, crystal deposition, recurrent gout flares, chronic trophaceous gout. Then the risk factors are, so that gives you an idea. So this is important stages of the disease. So you want to be at this stage at least, asymptomatic hyperuricemia. Defining picture in gout, acute podagra. Podagra means pores or feet. So common to see it in the first MTP joint. Now, complications. It can, recurrent attacks will cause degeneration. Sometimes they can get infected. Gout can cause uric acid nephropathy or uric nephropathy. Uh, susceptibility to infection, uric nephropathy is a separate entity than uric acid nephropathy, renal stones, nerve or spinal cord impingement of the tophi, fractures, the joints of tophaceous gut. These are advanced cases. That's the uh, tophus there. And uh, it usually occurs in the antihelix or never in the lobule area. There's this tophaceous gout with end stage renal disease. But as you can see, it cannot be mistaken for RA, that commonly is not, not that symmetric. It looks more sometimes like osteoarthritis or psoriatic arthritis, but still very different, very asymmetric. Now, you aspirate the fluid from a joint if it's swollen. You measure the uric acid, even though it's not diagnostic of gout. Just having high uric acid is not gout. Then 24-hour uric acid evaluation is done when you're starting urate lowering therapy, then blood studies to look at other concomitant uh, problems, uh, liver disease or uh, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and so on. Now, this is a very important slide. This is the classic crystal needle shaped of uh, uric acid inside a PMN. This is the rhomboid crystal seen in calcium pyrophosphate disease, which is a mimic of uh, another crystalline orthopathy, not related to uric acid. Now, 
this is a picture which is show yellow in a certain axis that is blue in a certain axis, a similar axis. Now, the MSU crystals are needle shaped and negative birefringent. This is positively birefringent. So this is uh, brought on by the way the crystal uh, rotates polarized light uh, under a special microscope. Now, uh, most of the time, early gout, you don't need a radiograph, but if there's persistent swelling or infection, you want to do an X-ray to see the stophi or, or there is any infection, ultrasounds and the bedside very useful to diagnose gout early and also gouty tophi and damage the joints. CT only in places where you're looking for tophi in the spinal cord, likewise MRI. Now there's a CT, which I'll allude to, it's a special CT. Now, these are tophi. Can you see these white spots here? These have been breaking down. And when they break down, you see the mass destruction of an overhanging edge of bone. That's called Martel sign, named after the famous radiologist at the University of Michigan. And this is classic for chronic to patients got. Sometimes these pictures will show, the extra will show up in a board exam. Now, this is the special uh, CT, which is different from a regular CT because it uses a different principle. And you see here the areas which are purple are normal. These are tophi, the green ones are tophi. Now, there's a little bit of green ones even in the resolution phase, but that's in the nail, and that's an artifact. This is tophaceous gout resolving with treatment. It's a very expensive modality, this uh, DCET, but if you have facilities in your uh, area where you practice, sometimes radiologists are interested, they may be willing to do this. Very useful in chronic to patient's gout. I would recommend this in every patient with gout. Now, this is a very important slide, the so-called double contour signed white arrow showing uh, uh, crystal deposition in the highland cartilage of the knee, then the one in the first metatarsophalangeal joint, and then this is the Doppler signal with the gout flare. In Europe, most of the primary care doctors have ultrasounds, especially in Germany. 98% of the primary care doctors have ultrasound. They know how to use it. Unfortunately, even rheumatologists are not able to use it in the United States. It's, uh, uh, it's a lamentable situation. <laughs> Anyways, how does gout cause other systemic problems? Now, the... The important thing that you need to remember, nitrous oxide inactivation, increased platelet aggregation, endothelial dysfunction again, then atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. So it's an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Now, asymptomatic hyperuricemia may also lead to some things. Mitochondrial oxidative stress, Again, reduce nitrous oxide, then the renin-angiotensin system stimulation, lipogenesis, fatty acid oxidation, all of that can cause problems with endothelial function. And then the relationship between chronic renal disease, chronic vascular disease, and hypertension is all brought on by similar uh, mechanisms, including COX-2 activation here. So what I'm trying to impress on you is this Gout should not be looked at just as a metabolic joint disease. Look at it beyond the joints. That's like I alluded to in RA. Now, we're coming to the most important part of the talk to gout is managed in three stages. I told you from a previous slide, you have the acute attack, then the phase where it's a little bit progressive and then ends up in topacious gout and then systemic gout. So how do you treat the acute attack? You provide prophylaxis to prevent acute flares after you treated the first acute attack. Then things simmer down a little bit. Then you look at long-term lowering of the uric acid and prevent uh, uh, uric acid nephropathy or preventing systemic complications like cardiovascular disease or uh, uh, deterioration of renal function. The guidelines of the American College are now fairly well established. This paper, if you guys later on go and read, look at Kana's paper from UCLA, a very, very uh, outstanding contributor to our knowledge on uh, management of gout. Now, acute gout. 
what the things in your therapeutic armamentarium to uh, stop the attack, NSAIDs, steroids, colchicine, ACTH, and combinations. You re relieve pain and inflammation with these uh, drugs. The choice of what you'll use will depend upon the concomitant health problems. Renal insufficiency, CCH or peptic ulcer disease will pretty much preclude the use of NSAIDs or colchicine. Now, colchicine, contrary to a lot of what people do in practice, a classic treatment once is now rarely indicated. Now, a multi center trial called contact trial showed significant difference in pain relief for seven days with naproxen was low dose colchicin. Naproxen caused fewer side effects and was as effective. Comorbid conditions limit sometimes the use of NSAIDs or colchicin. You try injecting intraarticularly a steroid, 20 to 40 milligrams, uh, depending on the joint you're injecting. Smaller joints need 20, larger joint like knee may need 40. And as long as the joint is accessible. Now, before you inject anything into a joint, make sure you exclude septic arthritis. That can be made by other clinical observations. Now, do not use aspirin because it can alter uric acid levels and potentially prolong an intensifying acute attack. Now, there's a paradox here. Low dose aspirin raises serum uric acid. High dose aspirin lowers the uric acid because of the way it affects. Uh, the uh, excretion. Now, cyclooxygenase inhibitor, celecoxy, has been used with success, but patients may require higher doses than are typically used. Maybe you need more than 400 milligrams, and that can create some problems. Avoid NSAIDs in people with GI problems, renal insufficiency, or abnormal hematic function. Patients taking warfarin should not use an NSAID, but use with caution a COX-2 inhibitor like celecoxy. Now, one uh, Anti-inflammatory drug is very weak. Uh, uh, dolobid will not be very effective in controlling the acute attack. Can still be used when somebody's on warfarin, but dolobid is not very useful in treating acute gout. Now, patients in intensive care unit who are predisposed to gastritis, particularly, you don't want to put them on any uh, NSAID. Now, Indusin, many people think it's the best drug for acute gout. Yes and no. Uh, no NSAID is superior, but when you're dealing with an older patient, over 65, avoid indocin because it can cause a mushy feeling and cloudy or uh, cognition. Now, in diabetics, in general, people with hypertension, be very watchful of their creatinine, and you may aggravate their hypertension or worsen their creatinine clearance. Uh, so you have to be very, very careful. And then people who are on concomitant ACE inhibitors, you have to be very careful with uh, NSAID and also using NSAIDs in combination with diuretics. Now, attacks are treated for two to five days and then you start tapering the dose. Now, once the attack is controlled, reduce it to one half or one fourth of the demand. Now, over two weeks, you completely taper the dose of NSAIDs. Now, gout symptoms should be absent for at least two days before an NSAID is discontinued. Now, colchicine, less commonly used, at least in my practice, and many people stop using colchicine with a narrow therapeutic window and risk of toxicity. It should be initiated within 36 hours of onset of an acute attack. And then the old regimen of increasing the dose till the patient cannot tolerate the GI symptom, it's not a good way of, it makes patients very miserable in addition to the misery already from an acute attack. And uh, newer recommendations we're using colchicine have come into place. The modern regimen favors 1.2 milligrams followed by 0 0.6 one hour later to initiate treatment of acute flare. Now, Dr. Turkeltop in the University of California, San Diego is a world authority on gout. He has done a very important study that uh, yielded this, uh, a regimen which uh, increased the maximum plasma concentration and brought about greater early gout flare efficacy than the high dose 4.8 milligrams over six hours. That, that is, let me go through that. And uh, so basically, data from other studies also have shown the same thing. Now, when you're using colchicin uh, in combination with extended release calcium channel blockers, verapamil, delta sign, but numerous PGP or CYP3A4 inhibitors like clarithromycin, cyclosporin, you have to be extremely careful uh, and also avoid grapefruit juice. Now, dosage of colchicin need not be adjusted when the drug is used in 
with azithromycin as opposed to pyrithromycin. Now, if the GFR is lower than 10 ml, it should be decreased the dose, at least half if the GFR is lower than 50. So if it's less than 10, don't give it. If it's less than 50, use very small doses, maybe half of a point six. Colchicin should be avoided in patients with hepatic dysfunction, bleed obstruction, or anybody who has uh, diarrhea already. Now, NSAIDs are a good uh, choice based uh, if they do not have underlying health problems. Uh, Indocin, as I alluded to in older patients, now se select always an agent of the quick onset, uh, onset of action. In other words, don't go to the extended release because it takes time for it to work. You want the, the ordinary uh, non-extended uh, release uh, medication to be used. Uh, in other words, don't use feldine or peroxicam because it's a long acting, one of the very long half-life, it takes time to work. Uh, your ibuprofen, cylindac, all of equally uh, effective and faster. A clinical response to colchicin is not pathognomonic for gout because it can happen in pseudogout, sarcoid orthopathy, psoriatic orthopathy, which is acute, or caps with tendinitis. Now, never use intravenous IV colchicin because you probably won't get it anyway because you know, FDA uh, uh, has uh, 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 too toxic for use because it causes bone marrow depression and severe leukopenia. Now, it used to be used in post-operative situations where patients cannot take anything over. Steroids have become a very important uh, alternative to NSAIDs or colchicin. It can be given orally, IV, intramuscularly, intraarticularly. It confers, I mean, parental uh, use confers no advantage unless the patient cannot take oral medication. Now, how do you give it? You give 40 milligrams for one to three days, then slowly taper it over two weeks, tapering more rapidly than in a rebound, uh, can result in a rebound flare. So what you do is use 40 for three days, then 30, 20, 10, five, something, or 15, 10, five. So st stretch it. Now, if you want to use it for more than two weeks, start worrying about osteoporosis. Uh, it can happen as early as uh, uh, a month or two months, especially in the spine. Changes come on very early. Depot, uh, long acting, are useful in monoarticular flare. Now, make sure the joint is not infected. ACTH has been used sometimes to stimulate body's own production of corticosteroids. It's expensive and uh, it's not advisable to use it. Now, the, if the patient does not respond to one end, uh, the initial dose of an NSAID, uh, use a recombination therapy. Uh, especially if multiple joints are affected or the same joint flares up all the time. So colchicin plus an NSAID, again, watching renal function, oral steroids plus small dose of colchicin, then intraarticular steroids plus colchicin NSAIDs. Now, anakinra, this is a drug which has been resurrected for use in acute gout in hospitalized patients, especially with comorbidities. Again, the patient should not be infected and they cannot tolerate something oral. Problem, expensive, one shot costs about $3,000. Anyways, so it shows remarkable. Canakinumab, another new kid on the block. This is an IL-1 beta antibody. I showed you all these are involved in acute reaction. Terribly expensive drug. Studies show it's very effective. The FDA smartly denied approval. It costs about eight to $10,000. Now, the temptation to treat a patient without a proven diagnosis must be always resisted. If you can get crystals identified as always good or the circumstantial evidence. Septic arthritis may clinically resemble gout or pseudogout. And if you neglect it, you can lose a limb, life or, or, or a limb. And as I told you, cartilage, time is cartilage in septic arthritis. So you want to make sure there's no septic arthritis before you inject any uh, steroids or, uh, or make a di false diagnosis of gout. Now, now, unfortunately, examination of joint fluid is not easy in smaller joints. And if you're in an emergency room situation, or urgent care situation, you cannot reach a rheumatologist or a pathologist, whatever fluid you get, keep it in the refrigerator. Give it to the pathologist or rheumatologist next day. The crystals will still be seen. Uh, that will strengthen your diagnosis. And then you can always change course in your treatment. So, Naproxen, again, seems a, a very definitely better alternative to colchicin. 
in this study. Now, very important. Therapy to control the underlying uricemia, hyperuricemia is contraindicated until the acute attack is controlled, unless kidneys are at risk because of an unusually healthy, heavy uric acid load. This is a very important statement. What it means is, if you're treating an acute gout, wait a couple of weeks, don't start them on allopurinol, number one. Number two, don't stop prophylactic cold chest if you're using 0 0.6 milligrams daily. That will prevent interval attacks. And attacks will come on if you don't use colchicin or a small dose of uh, NSAID prior to starting long-term uric acid lowering therapy. Now, the statement, unless kidneys are at risk, that is in oncology. If you're using uh, oncological drugs, there's a heavy load of uric acid, you've got to uh, control it with the chemotherapy to prevent damage to the kidney. Now, treatment of the underlying uricemia is only after uric acid, the attack is controlled. Starting therapy to control hyperuricemia during an attack intensifies prolonged the attack. If the patient had been on a consistent dosage of a uricosuric agent like probenicid or allopurinol, at the time of the attack, the drug should be continued at the same dosage during the attack. So that's an important statement. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing all this, these are the reasons why people, patients afflicted with acute gout keep coming back with more attacks. You treat them very effectively, the acute attack, but don't put them on a maintenance small dose of NSAID or a small dose of steroid or colchicin to prevent acute attacks when you start uric acid lowering therapy. Now, do you start uric acid lowering therapy in every patient who's had just one single attack? Most people won't. If there are more than two attacks in a year or patients has multiple attacks in a short period of time, uric acid lowering therapy is indicated. Now, new mantra, treat to target concept. That means if you start treating long-term uh, gout, you want to keep the serum uric acid level below six milligrams. If somebody has tophaceous gout, it's to keep it below five milligrams. If you're practicing in the United Kingdom, it is four milligrams per deciliter. So in this country, six milligrams. If it's gout, tophaceous gout, less than five milligrams per deciliter. That's the goal. Now, asymptomatic hyperuricemia should not be treated unless there are crystal deposition on ultrasound or radiological <coughs> imaging, and it occurs in a very small number of patients. Now, if somebody has levels higher than level milligram per deciliter, and they have renal stones or high risk for renal stones and renal impairment, you start monitoring these patients on long-term therapy. Now, these are the risk factors for gout, which some of which I alluded to. Most important thing, non-adherence to urate lowering therapy. Now, treatment, how do you, you bring the levels below six, the TOFI will reduce the number of size or disappear. Pain will be reduced, attacks will be absent. Then you monitor them every three to six months with the liver function test, CBC, creatinine. Now, TOFI, if they are progressing in spite of treatment, you have to modify treatment. They need not be surgically removed if they are small and in fewer places, but if they are infected or causing compression of the cord, like a spinal cord or intractable pain, or they're ulcerating, then you need to get the help of a surgeon. Delayed healing is still a problem when you remove TOFI. With modern therapy, recurrence of TOFI means patient is probably non-compliant or the treatment that you are instituted is not fully effective, you may want to make changes. Now, you got to, uh, this studies from Kaiser Permanente in Orange County and uh, uh, in Southern California by Dr. Levy, one of my former colleagues, says that if you, you uh, lower the urate early, you prevent serious damage to the kidney. That's the essence of that uh, uh, paper. Let's get to chronic gout. When patients are treated long-term, you've got to follow all the comorbid factors. They should be able to go on a diet. If obese, drop their weight, stop drinking beer. Beer is bad news for gout patients. Beer 
is mainly what does beer contain? Guanine. Guanine breaks down into uric acid. The other alcoholic drinks like wine in moderation or other uh, uh, drinks that you might consume are less of a problem, but you don't tell a gout patient that things are okay. You have to be very, very careful about alcohol ingestion in general. Now, so the only one attack occurs, it's best to follow them. Now, the risk of a second attack, 62% after one year, 78% after two years, 93% of 10 years. The longer uric acid goes untreated, it's there's greater chance the patient will come back to you. At that point, you start considering urine lowering therapy. Because the reason why you don't treat asymptomatic hyperuricemia is there's no other end organ damage or risks. The medications can be harmful. Now, when you start lowering therapy, one or more two five subcutaneously, evidence of damage on an imaging study, frequent attacks, or you're not getting to the target level, uh, you, so all that would be important in deciding. The ACR again recommends pharmacological urate lowering therapy for patients with chronic kidney disease stage three or worse, a serum uric acid cost of nine milligrams per deciliter or urolithiasis. So you'll see a lot of patients you follow CKD, with a rheumatologist, with a with a rheumatologist and uh, a nephrologist, that these patients will be on uh, lowering therapy because that might protect and preserve existing renal function. Now, this always remember this mantra. That is very very important. How long do you continue urine lowering therapy? Probably lifelong if the patient is at risk, and then make changes like if the hypertension. Uh, is being treated with thiazide diuretic, you could probably go to some other drug in place of a diuretic. Then avoid low-dose aspirin, I told you. Avoid medications which may elevate uric acid. Now, an ideal drug for hypertension in uh, when it coexists with uric acid problems is losartan, the ARB, because it's uricosuric at 50 milligrams a day. Now, medications which elevate uric acid can still be used by making appropriate dispensing allopurinol or probenicid if need be. Now, long-term treatment is focused on three drugs, allopurinol, febuxostat, and probenicid. Now, when do you do the urinary excretion? On an unrestricted diet, anything uh, uh, <clears throat> amounting less than 800 milligrams per 24 is, is normal. Anything in excess of that is abnormal. Now, why do you have to do that? You can decide if they are uh, hypo excretors, they can be uh, put on a uricosuric drug like probenicid. If they are hyper excretors, you should avoid probenicid and put them on a xanthine oxidase inhibiting drug like uh, allopurinol. Alkalinizing the urine with potassium citrate and in ingestion of copious amounts of fluid are adjunctive recommendations, particularly may be useful in patients with kidney stones. Now, if one drug, a uricosuric drug or uh, alone or uh, xanthine oxidase inhibition alone is not controlling the uric acid level, you can combine as long as kidney function is good. You have to understand a uricosuric drug is not very effective if the serum uh, uric acid is greater than two milligrams. So very, very important. Now, probenicid is still being used by some people, it's cheaper. Uh, especially if somebody is not excreting too much uric acid uh, or the patient, uh, 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 patients who, for whom the risk of using a xanthine oxidase inhibitor is too high. Now, this is a very important slide. Patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus who are treated with glucose transporters, the SGLT2 inhibitors, to prevent the absorption of glucose and lower serum uric acid levels. So maybe a good idea to use these drugs in a diabetic with gout. So that's a, and then there's also evidence that people who are treated aggressively for their gout may show control of their diabetes also. That might be possibly through a renal mechanism again. Now, prophylactic therapy. This is very important for all primary care providers. The time that you 
get off an acute attack, you want to maintain prophylaxis. You can reduce flares by 85%. This point six milligrams once or twice daily, that's depending on kidney function, but it should be continued for at least six to nine months after initiating urate lowering therapy. And then it can be discontinued or used a small dose at the discretion of the primary care physician in consultation with the nephrologist or rheumatologist. Now, dose reduction of colchicine, again, I alluded to this in an earlier slide, uh, because of the interactions. Now, you have to be watchful of long-term use of colchicine, especially if people have uh, some disturbance of renal function because it can still have the potential to cause marrow toxicity and the neuromyopathy and sometimes elevated CK and muscle weakness. It, these are very common in renal insufficiency patients. Now, when you start getting a flare while on uric acid lowering therapy, don't stop the medicine because that may itself cause an attack. Continue that in combination with uh, the prophylactic therapy and then switch course. Last part of the talk, uric acid lowering therapy. This slide is important again and bring back the biochemical reactions. Xanthine oxidase is a key step inhibiting urate production, the two drugs. We don't have uricase, but now we have peglotecase, which is a pegylated uricase in patients with TOFI. And then the, the, on the right side, you're normalizing renal urate through renal excretion. Probenicid is still used. Lesinorad showed a lot of promise but the drug was not as popular and the company start produce, uh, st uh, stopped production. That works on the urate, URAT1, the enzyme I told you, which helps kidney uh, to get rid of the uric acid. Benzbromazone was used in Europe, not used in this country anytime, uh, so don't worry about it. Now, this is a little bit more co complicated slide, but what I want you to see here the reabsorption is through an enzyme called OAT4, whereas inhibition of URAT1 with probenicid makes you leak more protein, uh, more, leak more uric acid, sorry. So these drugs, in the future, more drugs will come into play uh, with the knowledge of these enzymes. And unfortunately, lesinorad uh, came uh, with a lot of recommendations. It uh, fell by the wayside. So this is where lesson of right acts on your right one. And uh, there is also O4. There's another drug which has been uh, experimented with, still not in common use yet. Now, allopurinol is the drug you need to know uh, in detail, blocks the anti xanthine oxidase. For up to, 10 to, up to 10 percent of patients taking these drugs may develop symptoms of intolerance dyspepsia, headaches, diarrhea, or pruritic macropapular rash. Now, anybody who has a rash which comes on acutely with itching should be looked uh, at for hypersensitivity. It occurs in 1% of cases or less, hypersensitivity syndrome, mortality is 20 to 30%. Fever, toxic epidermal necrolysis of the skin, severe dehydration, bone marrow suppression, eosinophilia, like a dress syndrome, Leukocytosis, kidney failure, liver failure, vasculitis, and death. Corticosteroids are often used to treat this syndrome, but still patients can die if it's diagnosed late. It's almost like a Stevens uh, Johnson syndrome uh, or a dress syndrome, uh, using clear systemic symptoms due to a drug rash. Now, it can be a delayed response six to eight weeks after initiation as opposed to an immediate reaction. It's a cell-mediated immune reaction to allopurinol and it's metabolized, which is oxypurinol. Um, IV acetylcysteine has been used besides steroids in stung patients. Now, what is important today, we have a very mixed a heterogeneous population of patients in the United States. And severe allopurinol hypersensitivity is more likely to occur in patients with renal insufficiency, those who take a thiazide diuretic, those started on allopurinol straight away, uh, at a dose of 300 milligrams a day. 
what is important because of the heterogeneity of our patient population, strong association has been found between severe allopurinol or hypersensitivity reaction of carriage of the HLA B5801 allele. You remember that. It's an important thing in your practice. Now, if somebody is of a South Asian descent, particularly Han Chinese or Korean or Thai living close to the Chinese border or in an African American, you need to inquire about any reactions the skin they've had from other drugs. I would get this B5801 allele and then they may uh, not be able to take this drug. ACS strongly recommends you start people at 100 milligrams or less and build it up to 300. If it's tophaceous gout, you can go up to 800 gradually. Now, if somebody has renal disease, you can even start at 50 milligrams and titrate them. And surprisingly, even people with renal insufficiency, if you titrate it slowly, they seem to tolerate higher doses, contrary to what the apologist told us earlier on. Now, the risk of allopurinol adverse cutaneous reactions are more common in heart disease patients as well as a report from a study from British Columbia. In those patients who took more than 100 milligrams, they're 11 fold higher risk. Now, again, with the HLA B5801 uh, carriage in older women who have heart disease, the risk was 23 fold higher than in younger men with heart disease from other without heart disease, sorry. In other words, if you have an older woman, you want to uh, study with the HLA-B5801 allele, they have a risk of 23 fold higher than in younger men without heart disease from other regions. Again, this is the uh, British Columbia study. Uh, now, you have to make sure that hyperuricemia is not related to heart disease medication before even starting allopurinol. Uh, given that risk. Now, in patients with CKD, you titrate upward every two to five weeks from a low dose, even as 50 milligrams, until you get to six milligrams per deciliter. You don't have to get there uh, to that level of silicon in a jiffy. You can do it slowly, titrate it up gradually as you go along. Every, initially every, Four weeks, you study the uh, kidney uh, creatinine, uh, SGPT or ACRT, and maybe a CBC. Then once you're comfortable, patient tolerating the drug well, you can do it every three months, and after a year or two, every six months, the uh, uh, test can be done to monitor. Now, that way you avoid the possibility of severe reactions. This I alluded to earlier, you can go up to 800 milligrams of tophaceous gout if you titrate it slowly. Always remember that patients uh, who are on azotyperin, the allopurinol prolong the half-life of the drug. So you've got to adjust the dose of allopurinol. If you're cyclophosphamide, increase the bone marrow toxicity of the drug. If you're going to treat an infection with ampicillin, the risk of having a rash when they're on concomitant Allopurinol is significant. Now, you can use it with probenicid as long as kidney function is good. Now, probenicid also increases the excretion of allopurinol, so you got to make adjustments if you use the combination. Okay, so that's uh, an important thing. Well, let's go into uh, some other things. Hibuxostat is a non purine selective inhibitor of xanthine oxidase. It's an alternative to gout treatment, again, metabolizing the liver administered orally, you can use it in renal failure patients. Um, the problem, the dose can be adjusted according to uh, the criteria laid out uh, the dose was recommended, but there's no concern about renal impairment. Now, the effect was very significant with the higher dose of 800, so 80 milligrams a day, but the standard dose most people used was 14 milligrams a day. Now, what happened was, the, the dose is very impressive uh, in controlling uricemia in renal failure patients as well. But the dinger came when all cause mortality in cardiovascular mortality were higher with febuxostat than with allopurinol. The hazard ratio for death from any cause 1.22 and HR for cardiovascular death 1.34. Now this created 
uh, major concern for everybody, nephrologists and rheumatologists using this drug. And now the FDA carries a, a black box warning. So very little febuxostat is used. Now, if somebody cannot tolerate allopurinol, if you want to take the risk, the, the patient can tolerate it and there's no likelihood of adverse reactions. Uh, it can be used, but even there, there's a 10% risk of cross-reactivity between allopurinol and febuxostat, almost like penicillin and cephalosporins. <laughs> so most people stay away from it. Then vitamin C has been used, phenofibrate and lesinurad uh, phenofibrate and uh, the R uh, drugs may be useful when used in combination with gout treatment because phenofibrate for hyperlipidemia and R for hypertension may help lower the uric acid to a small extent in combination with the uric lowering treatment. Now, lesinurad, when it came into use, was combined with allopurinol and was very effective. But unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the drug... Uh, had problems with uh, manufacturing and hence uh, it uh, went out. So you don't need to spend too much time on it at this time. Uricase. This is the debulking of the total urate load. Useful, uh, the rabric case is, rabro uricase is used by oncologists they would do for preventing the tumor lysis syndrome. It can give you anaphylactic reactions. Uh, and uh, so it has to be used in caution done in a chemotherapy infusion center uh, where uh, you know treatment of an acute uh, reaction can be taken care of. Now, the ACR guidelines do not recommend peglotic as the first-line approach. It's very expensive. Vitamin C has a uricosuric effect. It mildly reduces serum concentration of uric acid, 500 milligrams a day for two months. Now, Dr. I, Metcalf, really quickly, we're about three minutes out from the top right, of the hour, okay. and I know a lot of people are moving on to the next session. So, I'm yeah, not sure. sure. Foods uh, high in uric acid uh, have to be avoided, especially organ meats and so on, but diet restriction alone does not control serum uric acid levels, but it's an important thing alcohol weight reduction. Rheumatologists should be involved in the care with the primary care physician and nephrologist if need be. Now, as far as the guideline summary, it's very similar to what I alluded to in the 2020 recommendations. You use ULT, that's your note in patients with severe disease with TOFI or without TOFI with radiographic damage. You wait after you treat the acute attack do prophylaxis with, uh, uh, to prevent an acute attack while on urate lowering therapy. And uh, in patients with asymptomatic hyperuricemia, you don't use urate lowering therapy. Now, allopurinol has still become the gold standard because of the problems with febuxostat. Uh, the use of peglotecase is only in severe tophaceous gout, and it's not a first line drug. And then using allopurinol carefully with uh, adjustments to dosing in CKD patients, slow titration, and uh, the anti-inflammatory prophylaxis to prevent acute attacks, again, very similar to what I had mentioned, continuing the anti-acute uh, uh, attack prophylaxis for three to six months, up to nine months, if need be, to prevent attacks while on ULT treatment. Now, keeping the serum urate target less than six milligrams in regular gout and then tobacious gout at five milligrams. And uh, screening them for the HLA uh, B5801 allele in patients with high risk of getting a reaction from allopurinol. So uh, uricosurix are recommended if uh, patients can tolerate it and they don't excrete too much uric acid on a critical urine specimen. And then you can combine xanthine oxygen inhibitor with a uricosuric drug if you want to better control the serum uric acid level. So that is pretty much what I wanted to tell you. And uh, I'll be very happy to answer the uh, questions. Uh, Meredith, are you going to send it to me by email or? Yes, Dr. Venka, okay. thank you so much because I know we have a lot of topics today and a lot of right. content. Um, I will consolidate everyone's questions that I've received, send them to you via email and I'll distribute your answers to everybody 
with your slides. Um, and just a housekeeping update for everybody that's on this talk currently, there's been a change of venue for Dr. Upchurch's talk, which is next. You should all have received an email in your inbox um, and that will contain the new Zoom link. But if you have not received an email, um, I'm gonna put my email in the chat and you can reach out to me and I can send you the new Zoom link for Dr. Upchurch's talk and they're aware we're running a few minutes late, so if it takes you a while to get over there, no problem. Meredith, also give my cell number to people. Oh. I can text it to you or email you, and uh, if they want to call me, if they have a difficult case. Or... Perfect. Yeah, I will do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Venkat, and thank you. Everybody. Thanks for your patient listening, all of you, and thank, uh, thank you, Meredith, for uh, you know uh, conducting the <laughs> sessions uh, without any glitch. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, everybody. We'll see you in the next talk if you're going on to Dr. Upchurch's and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. And I'll be sure to forward everyone the slides and the talk will be published on the Maven Project website in about approximately one week. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.